Hi everybody, it's great to be back here again tomorrow. It's Friday, let's get down to our Torah lesson, this, this portion. Bashat Vayetze, Yaakov Inu has to leave Israel, and he has to um, run away from his brother Esav, he has to find wives, and he ends up spending 20 years with Lavan, a very, very um, evil person, a criminal basically, who's trying to cheat him and is trying to um, take what is rightfully Jacob's. And this whole process, in the middle of the whole story, finally when when Joseph is born, it's time to return to the land of Israel, and um, Yaakov approaches his wives and he says, "We have to go home." And they, of course, agree. They want to, they want to get out of that atmosphere of Lavan. And something happens very strange. Rachel takes the trophim, these idols of her father Lavan, and she puts puts them in her camel sack when they leave um, and run away from Lavan. And the question is, why did she do such a thing? And there. Are, Many different opinions. I saw an interesting article that summarizes all these opinions by a professor named Rabbi Alexander Klein, um, or Alexander Klein, a professor, I don't know if he's a rabbi, but um, in Israel, the, some of the most simplest people, simplest people are great Torah scholars. And again, I don't know much about this particular um, professor, but I enjoyed reading a nice summary on the, the reasons behind, um, behind Rachel taking the um, trophim of, of Jacob, and it was definitely an easy um, way of saving some research time. <laughs> and it's very interesting, and he brings down different opinions, and he brings down the classical explanations, and I'll mention a few of them. We know that some of the reasons are, basically, Rachel wanted to prevent her father from worshipping idols, and therefore, she took the trophim, which was his idol, was an idol that was able to see the future, he used that to try to predict um, the future, and she took them away from him to try to, um, and somehow the last thing she did before she left the father's house was to try to rectify him a little bit. So the question comes up, if that's the case, why didn't she immediately de um, destroy the trophim? So the Todot Yitzchak explains that she didn't have time, she just quickly grabbed him and took him away before she really had time to hide them, etc. So that's one, one powerful reason, preventing a father from worshipping idols, and this we see is the, re is the powerful reason mentioned in in the Zohar Kadosh, the famous great Kabbalist, Rabbi Shun Ba Yochai, and who explains that that's the reason why she was punished later on, although she did the right thing, by preventing a father from worshipping idols, but she still caused him anguish and pain from taking something away from him, and that's why she died in childbirth. It's a powerful statement. Rashi adds a different reason. It was Jacob that said, anyone who took the, your idols will, will surely die, and he basically cursed that person, not knowing that Rachel took them up. So these are two possible reasons of why Rachel um, was punished, although she did the right thing of taking away the trophim. And obviously we can't possibly understand the taking these trophim for a reason of um, personal use. That wouldn't make sense. A great um, soul like Rachel, who's precious mother of Israel, crying for the children of Israel, would not be involved in, in idol worship, God forbid. So we are definitely not going that direction. Another reason I saw that why that she, she stole the trophim was an, a reason that um, she believed that if she if um, Lavan would have the trophim in his house, he'd be able to look in the future, because that's what they did. They were future tellers. And he would be able to see where they were hiding out. So she took the trophim to prevent from um, Lavan knowing where Jacob and they were all hiding out. So that's another reason, again, a tactical reason of why not only preventing a father from idol worship, but not letting him know where they were all hanging out and hiding. There was a very interesting reason brought down by the Meshe Chochmah, one of the uh, interesting commentaries, and a classical commentary, is a later, on, again, not too long ago, in the 1800s. And the Meshe Chochmah, he talks about um, how if a person is surrounded by idol worship, there is no divine revelation. God is not going to enter a situation. The Shekhinah, the presence of God, will not enter a home where there are idols. So therefore, her whole idea was to take the idol out of the father's house so we'd have some kind of divine revelation, a connection with God. And this would, as a matter of fact, ended up on being a tremendous, um, a tremendous um, help for Jacob because we know the intentions of Laban and Lavan were to come out and to attack and use physical force. So when this happened, God said, God did come to him and said, beware, do not touch, um, do not touch, put your hands on Jacob. So this was an interesting explanation, very, very creative, 
that that's why it was taken to allow him to have that revelation. The problem with this explanation is that if she's bringing these idols in the hands of Jacob, perhaps it can prevent now them from having divine revelation, but that is not really a question because I saw this is what that professor asked when he brought this explanation down, but I don't think it's a question because in reality, when someone believes in that, in those idols, so it's, if it's in his circle, it can have an influence, but if someone like Jacob is completely um, divorced of any kind of idol worship and Rachel, so therefore just, it would be like a, just a, a piece of stone or a piece of dirt hanging around and it really wouldn't maybe perhaps have any effect on, their, on the God coming to them. Because we see how in situations, the most interesting situations of where Hashem comes and, and prophesizes, prophets, you know, sometimes in areas where there are so we see with the whole story of Elijah, and there were people worshiping idols, but, and they were next to Elijah, but God is prophesizing Elijah right there, although they were idol worshippers standing next to him, and they were praying to their Baal, to their idols. But anyway, that's an interesting explanation. But there's really one special um, explanation that was brought down and by a person, and I'll try to remember his name because he's, he's not known, but he happens to be um, an Israeli... Uh, computer specialist of working for the Israeli Social Security. His name is Ariel Soltoman. I think his name is here. Stolman. That's his name. And he comes with a very interesting explanation, which I, I really enjoyed to hear. And he says like this. He says that Rachel really wanted to educate um, Jacob. And if we look at the whole story of Jacob, his life, we see that he was always somehow trying to... He, well, he had a, a, a method of not approaching something directly, but indirectly. In other words, the first thing was when, when, when Esau was um, going to be offered these blessings of, of Isaac, and we know that Esau despised the, the, the birthright, Jacob you know, went ahead with his mother's advice, but he, he did something that was not so, didn't seem so straight by stealing the blessings. He could have approached directly Yitzchak, Isaac, and explained to him and tried to maybe approach it a different way than have to do it roundabout by trying to steal the blessings away. It looked like he was like... You know, he didn't approach it directly. He had to do it indirectly. It ended up causing him a lot of problems, including running away from Israel and spending many years outside the land. So we can look at that as a certain um, mythology that he had, a certain what a, you know, way of, of doing things that wasn't, that wasn't um, in Rachel's eyes, the proper way. She, she didn't like that way of behavior. And later on, we see the same thing in her father's house. He's being tormented by her father and... and Starting out, instead of getting Rachel, he gets, he gets Leah, and he doesn't. He just accepts it and works for many more years. He could have stood for, up for his own, and 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 said, "What's going on over here? <laughs> give me now. You know, I want to go home. Give me a Rachel. I'm getting out of here." But he really didn't stand up for his rights. He sort of gave in over there. He didn't really allow, you know, allow um, basically tell his father-in-law off if he did that. And then later on, we see also with all the with his getting paid, the way he cheated him and he, <laughs> um, Lavan, every you know, trying to take. As Jacob says, ten times he changed his, his payment, whatever, the, the agreements they had. In other words, Jacob never really stood up, but what does he do? He decides to run away. That's his response, running away. We see it later on when he approaches, um, you know, we see it later on, you know, in, in his life. Finally, well, that's something I want to add to the picture, is that later on we see him approaching Esav directly. <laughs> I'm coming back now. In other words, that's a, maybe a sign that can add to this um, idea of, of Ariel. Um, the computer expert <laughs> from the Israel Self Security that we see later on that he does approach Esau directly and coming back to Israel, which is very, very, very um, interesting. That he's now willing to approach the problem instead of avoiding it on the side, which is excellent. But so here we see that's exactly what Rachel is saying. So what does Rachel do? Her husband is constantly avoiding conflict and not approaching it directly. So she wants to educate him. So what does she do? She takes the trophy. She takes the father's idols, knowing that he's going to come running, you know, because if she didn't take them, he probably would have stayed there and it would have been over. But she thought by now, by taking these, these idols of a father, he would sure lure him into the trap. Then Jacob would have to face the father-in-law head on and tell him what he thinks about him. <laughs> That's exactly, we see what took place, and, and she succeeds in that mission. And, and therefore, we can learn from this particular explanation is that the, I think what adds, you know, is that of course we see how important it is. You know, this is the beauty of, of, the, of the harmony between husband and wife. Sometimes the wife will see a certain a certain trait in the husband and realize that her her job is is to try to rectify her husband, just like husband rectifies his wife. And with her, 
amazing, I guess, um, genius in luring her, knowing her father very well, knowing her husband. She brought them into direct conflict in order to reason out and show that Jacob will stand up for his, for his own rights and stand up for what's his. And that I'm adding, I said, I wanted to add to this whole picture, was that when he comes back to the land of Israel, he is now willing to face directly Esau and say, here I am. You know, although we know that yeah, we do, he, divide, he divides up his, you know, the family, etc., etc. He does the proper means to protect them, but he was willing to face them directly. And that's very, very interesting. But anyway, here's a little enlightenment, hopefully a little bit source of light for the Shabbat um, dinner table tonight. And have a wonderful Shabbat, and we'll see you all. I am going to be traveling um, for the next two weeks. I should be in New York City. So I do hope I will try to get a lesson out, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to. So please forgive me if for a couple of weeks is a little break. Maybe we'll um, <laughs> maybe we'll get a chance to see some old towers, or um, we'll be back, um, God willing, soon. Anyway, have a wonderful Shabbat, and we'll talk soon. Shabbat shalom, b'sarot avot, yishorot v'nechamah.